countdown? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Barossa HQ from the surrounds, picturesque surrounds of our studio, Barossa HQ, the next best thing to being there. And this evening I'm delighted to welcome the always affable Mr. Jimmy Lindner. Thank you. And the gimlet-eyed Dean Hewitson. <laughs> Cheers. Gents, welcome. And a shout out to um, Jet Robbins. I see Stuart, you're already online. Obviously keen and chomping at the bit. Now, um, the idea of these shows, and this is this is number three in the chapters of the Barossa story, and I'm really looking forward to this because not only do I think it's going to be fascinating, but I have a feeling we're going to look at some pretty tidy wines. Um, the theme is old vines. So, just to start with, just to get everyone up to, to, to pace. Old vines. What is an old vine and, and why are they important? Jimmy. Uh, thanks for looking at me there. <laughs> um, That's why you're here, mate. Well, I suppose for me personally, um, it's the sort of... They're the sort of things that I was sort of, uh, I suppose, open to wine about. People were saying about, particularly in certain areas of the Barossa, um, that one, you know, this is something that we have in our own backyard that you can't replicate in many other wine growing countries in the world. Um, and to me, that is probably the, the most important thing. And I think, you know, our approach to um, old vines as far as in compared to, you know, other areas that sometimes will pull their vineyards out at probably the age we start to classify vines of old um, as old vines because they feel that youth is better, you know, and as I'm getting older I'm finding youth is good but also age is better, only because I'm at that age now. <laughs> <laughs> Very handy, yeah. aren't you? And, and Dean, for you, the magic of old wine, what's well, it all what, about? What drew me to the Brossa Valley is this extraordinary wealth of vines that go back pre phylloxera and as we know, phylloxera, you know, hitting Europe and even um, the east coast of Australia, you know, but the, the, the very early 1900s, the right. rest of the world had been wiped out, and, and, and an absolute fluke of nature that South Australia was spared this devastating. Um so, so, just to put this into context for, for um, our audience and our followers, yeah. you're, you're talking about a, a, a blight, a louse, that really pretty much did for European viticulture at, at the end of the, the 19th century, leaving them in a position where they pretty much had to replant. Now that didn't visit Australia, did it? So curiously, although they like to call us the New World, mm. which makes me scratch my head sometimes, am I right in saying we've actually got some of the oldest vines that are still well, producing in the world? Well, it actually did visit Australia, but it didn't ever visit South Australia. Right, right. And so South Australia actually does have the oldest vines in the world. It's incredible. And it's an which varieties story. are we talking about here when we talk about the oldest vines? We're talking Shiraz, Grenache, Mourvedre. Yeah. Probably some old Riesling. Old videos. Riesling, maybe old Sam. You know, if you look at the traditional varieties that first come to the region, could have been uh, you know, Pedro, examined, you know, fortified uh, mm -hmm. materials. We, um, you know, they might be hard to be seen these days, but um, you know, in certain little patches, you know, you still can find old Carignan, you can find old Malbec, but you know, they're they're pretty well tucked away and hidden. The interesting thing about the phylloxera thing um, to me is that there's a, if you're ever very interested in, in reading the history, there is a book called Phylloxera and it goes about how it was sort of introduced into Europe and a lot of it came from, you know, like all of us in the wine industry, we're always interested in what's new and, uh, and you know, that we should try this variety and try that variety and we're seeing a lot of that in these, uh, this modern era. And, uh, and that's what really started, it was the Europeans wanting to see what American vines could do in their own backyard, could they make wines as mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. as what the traditional European varieties, and, and that's really where it was honed, and, uh, and where actually flocks are originated from, is just bringing those vines over from America in those early years, and they would just didn't know, could you imagine being in that era, being a, you know, a farmer on your land for so many generations, and then next minute your vines started to die and you could not work out for the sure. life of you how that worked. Mm -hmm. Now that's been incredible. And I think at the height of it, um, the French government offered something like 300,000 gold francs to anybody that could come up with a solution to, to, Solve it. Yeah, to yep. um, get rid of this blight. And they tried 
drowning vineyards. They tried um, pumping chemical into the ground to try to like kill them because they found, a, a, you know, eventually they're at root level. Sure. Um, you know, it would be devastating. You know, to, particularly for a long time, and you didn't realise that there was an end in sight or a cure. Sure. So let's let's focus um, without being too mercenary on the upside of that story and what it means for Australia. What I'm taking out of that is that this this country or this continent actually has therefore a fantastic resource mm -hmm. from which to draw in terms of this um, uh, old vine material. And I guess um, in a world where we're told that everything is new is always better, in, in a nutshell and in an essence, and we will dig into this and uh, explore Old's, a little bit Old's further. the new black. Old is the new black, great. If there is a single property that an old vine confers upon a finished wine that a young vine can't, what is that? What is that benefit? What is that property? You want to go first? Oh, you can go first. I'll go. <laughs> it's, it's the ability to um, produce year in, year out a, a wine um, with, with the consistency. And that's what old vines do bring. Um, sure, you can have you can have young vineyards to produce great wine, and you can have old vineyards to produce great wine. But year in year out, through the through the storms and the droughts and the wet weather, whatever, the roots going so deep give a consistency and a uh, and a being a well being. It's as if these vines can be, uh, are their own power, and I think that's the secret of old vines. Fantastic, Jimmy. Yeah. I, I tend to agree, like, um, I suppose the one thing uh, mainly with a lot of these older vineyards too is that, you know, this is well before irrigation, you know, these vines have actually survived, you know, of ages, you know, um, without irrigation, so therefore that has forced, like Dean says, the roots to go well down. Um, I remember someone coming and saying how the, uh, the Freedom Vineyard handled it in 2001 and it was the warmest year in 100 years, it was like... Well, it was there on the warmest year, a hundred years before, mm, and got exactly. through that. So, sure. but for for us, it's the the roots really getting down in through the soil profiles, um, getting into the rock and and the strata of whatever that site is, um, and often you find actually, and it's interesting, but during uh, you know some of the periods that we've had through the Barossa, you know the old vines that are still in existence today. The only reason that they are is because they've always produced great wine. They've, they've been right. certain site specific, sure. so that that's why they remain today. Yeah. A couple of questions yeah. coming out of those two um, remarks. The first of which you, you started talking about the roots and the root systems. How deep can these things? You know, I'm, I'm almost getting the picture of a of an iceberg. You know, it's what's below the waterline that you've got to watch out for. Yeah. So if we see these, and, and I have seen them, they are extraordinary, rather beautiful kind of gnarled constructions above the ground. Yeah. How deep do these roots go into the soil? Well, Gibbo, Gibson's done some uh, some digging. <laughs> ah, this is Rob Gibson? Yeah. 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 And um, and he's explored root systems 10 metres down. But more importantly, he's watched the profile through dying, um, you know, the, the strata, the, the, sure. you know, the uptake of water. And the, the vine, you know, the, and it, which makes perfect sense. So in the early part of the season, the vine draws its water from the top part of the soil. Yeah. In the later, in, and as the season progresses, it, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's the difference because younger vines only have their vines in the top part of the sure, soil. Sure. So at the end of the season, in a dry season, they just can't go any further. There's nothing there to draw the water out. Sure. These old vines go down 10 metres. I mean, okay. that's an extraordinary yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's extraordinary. Absolutely. And, and the other thing about old vines, too, and like I say, particularly when they're a dry farm. Um, you find that they do have an amazing surface root area because they, they try to maximise what they can in those yeah. drought years with yeah. any small amount of rain. But as Dean said, you know, as the, those roots go down, if you've got different layers of certain attributes in your soil profile, as that sort of tap root comes down, you get like sort of peripheral roots that come out. And so you can have roots that are going in sand, so you can have it in gravel, and, and it actually can layer all... So you're bringing all these different mineral elements that you'll get from, you know, some of these ancient old barossa soils. Which is complexity, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, no, yeah la it's last bit of background just before we hop into the wines, because I'm hoping that we can tell the story of old vines largely through actually being able to, to taste the wines that they produce. But... Um, 
going back to the history and we've put it in context, then obviously this is about the Barossa. So the Barossa actually has, it's not legislation, but it has an old vine charter. Mm -hmm. yeah. right in saying that. Now, does that designate different sorts of how old is old? Can, can, can someone take us through that? Well, um, to me, it sort of it, it is a charter. You know, yep. you don't necessarily have to stick to it if you don't want to. But I think from a regional perspective, it gives us a little bit of internal guidelines of what we feel yep. is old, and it doesn't just come from one or two people telling everybody what old is. It comes from the, a, a regional association. So you're drawing from the knowledge and the wealth that the Barossa has from, say, a Henchke, from an O'Callaghan, from a Hillsmith, and you know the list is endless. So it's sort of generational community knowledge that gets passed yeah. on. I, I like the idea of that. Yeah, and so, and not only that, it's sort of open because one of the interesting things when it comes to trying to determine what uh, a region feels is that some people go, oh, you know, there might be little bits of bows and crosses. It's like, oh, I don't know if this is right. But it's an evolution thing. So, you know, as we understand and more science comes in to help, we can, that can sort of determine things. But at this point, I think we've really discovered some, some interesting, um, I suppose, age groups. Um, and I think old vines for us um, as a region in the charter, we start at 35 years old. Right? Okay. Yeah. I think it's great because at the end of the day, if you put old vine yep. on a Bross Valley or a Bross and wine, yep. it actually means, means something. something. Yeah. Sure. And that's important because we can all say it's old and it could be older than your two-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not old. And but certainly that, that, that terminology, I think I'm right in saying, in, in, in France, if you see vieille vin on a, on, a, on, a, on a bottle, it's not uniformly applied and it, it's not oh, certain right. at, at what point that terminology becomes relevant or cuts in. So you've actually got a graded system yeah. that the consumer can understand should they, um, yeah. he or she, wish to... And it's terrific. It. It, it, exactly. It, it, it's, it's truth, it's guidance, yep. and it's... Um, so, just I think not, not, not to, not to yeah. be too pedanting on the point, but it starts at 35. Yeah. And th those are what? They're just... We, we classify a 35-year-old vine as an old vine. Yep. Um, then we sort of creep it up a little bit to around the 70-year-old mark. Yep. And, and we've called it a survivor vine. Okay. And um, people sort of go, survivor, you know, where's that lie? And I, and I think what we did initially was go, right, well, anything that is 70 years or older actually got through one of the most infamous times in the region and that was the, the great vine pull in the 1980s yeah and um, we thought well you know to be 70 years old it means you actually survive probably the, the biggest sort of like drawing of vineyard out of the ground in our region in its history and and so it sort of it might be sort of around the you know a, a bit fuzzy line but it helps us to tell a story sure. that I think the world needs to know that you know, at some point in our history, you know, there was people that actually didn't really understand or, or put old vineyard into a, um, I suppose, into a, a, a level of um, quality or um, that, you know, they thought, well, we can just pull it out. Mm. It's just a, it's just a vine. And in fact, that period, importantly, I think, was the cementing of um, old vine and an understanding of old vine when people were saying, oh, hang on a minute, do you know that you're pulling out? You know, pure vines on their own roots of significant age that is in, irrepl irreplaceable. Sure. You know, anywhere in the world, and that's yeah. where it really started the old vine thing for me. So we go from an old vine to a survivor at around seventy years. Yeah. Where do we go from there? Hundred year old is centenarian. Yeah. Centurion. Uh, centenarian. Centenarian. Yeah, it's funny actually, Dean, because um, it's changed. A, a, originally it was centurion, Apparently. and then there was an email. I've got, from read, the, I've got to read my notes. <laughs> <laughs> there was an email from the community Thanks saying, for me know. saying, mate, a hundred year old vine is not a Roman, um, you know, centurion. So, yeah, yeah. Glad they picked that up. And, uh, so, <laughs> but this is the great thing about community. It's like you can put it out there and someone will come back and have a point yeah, of view. Yeah, and yeah. You, if people and it's a better word. It's a much better word. Well, it's not too bad unless you've had a few drinks. You try to say centenarian when you've had a couple. <laughs> I tell you, it's bloody bit difficult. So we go from a hundred year <laughs> centenarian yeah. to, to ancestral at yep. 125 plus, um, and really that's to try to reflect that these actual, these vines that are 125 years old plus today, you know, have been planted by the pioneers, of the ancestral sort of first people that come to yep. the region. And, that's and, really, 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 really. Uh, Yeah, and I, and I would have to say um, too with that, you know, really when you're looking at old vines and you're looking at sort of 70 to, you know, the cent, you know, the 100 year old, 125 year old, the difference really in, in what they're sort of providing might be very, very minuscule, but it does give a little bit of a, 
It gives a story. It gives it gives it truth and some. Oh, look, I think apart from anything else, it, it's it's just a wonderful part of your history and heritage. It's like celebrating architecture and history. If these things are there and living and surviving, it it just adds to the richness, literally, of the landscape that you live in. And I think yeah. it's it's interesting that these things are so old and so ancient. What I'm picking up from you, Jim, is is, is celebration and the understanding of their significance and importance yeah. is a relatively new thing. Yeah. And I would say on that too, actually, it's um, when you take these to market and you try to explain it, and you know, old vine in, in our own backyard just in Adelaide or South Australia, you know, it's something that a lot of the Adelaideans, you know, have heard for a long time, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a little bit like, you know, another old vine or, or whatnot. But, you know, when you start to take it to the world, you know, these people will start to go, oh, I, I, I'm actually getting this. So you actually got old vineyard material grown in their own roots. It's older than mm. the Rhone, older than Bordeaux, older than Champagne, older than Burgundy. Yeah. It's an extraordinary story. I think but that's fantastic because yeah. it's certainly, um, from my interaction with consumers, it's not the story that people are expecting to hear about Australia. Yeah. I think everybody makes the mistake of thinking Australia is yeah. 20 yeah. years old in terms of its wine history. Yeah. And I think when you discover the families that go back 150, 160 years, now we're hearing the the, 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 the actual um, the vines that produce the fruit do the same thing. Yeah. And suddenly we've got a rather more textured history, a rather more layered history than perhaps the world might know. And that's that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Dean, I feel I cut you off there. Not at all. No? Okay. No, no. I, d I just feel with that though too, <laughs> it's all it's it's nice to also uh, recognise too that, you know, like that, that time of the phylloxera through Europe you know, and how devastating that was, and for those families, you know, I could imagine that in our backyard, it would be, you know, and not knowing an answer to that, but to know that they're able to, you know, be able to graft those European vines onto American rootstock and replenish some of those magnificent vineyards, you know, from a wine perspective, the world would be a poorer place without sure. them. So it's good to know that you can get on with the wine business and make still quality wine based on that sort of knowledge and understanding, which they've been happy to share with a lot of um, countries that have gone through similar things in, a, in later history. But, you know, touch wood, we don't have to experience that and we can still provide some amazing wines to the, to the world, you know, for those purists and stuff as well. So Great. Well, I'm going to interrupt the information flow now and suggest that we have a look at um, the fruits of these vines. And um, somewhat unusually, and I don't, I don't know why, but I guess... When I think of old vines, I always think of red wine. And yet, this evening we're starting with what, James? Well, we're starting with an Eden Valley Riesling yeah. uh, from Rockford. Um, yeah. You know, we're blessed really in the Barossa that we do have um, an array of um, varieties that have got age that are quite significant. And, um, you know, for me, you know, personally, Rockford's is uh, one of those wineries that had inspired me in my youth, you know, and uh, I've learned a lot from from um, Robert and uh, as well as a lot of other winemakers but so it was a pleasure for me to, to, to ring up and say hey look you know can we uh, tap into this and I spoke to uh, um, to Ben who's uh, been making a lot of the wine mm -hmm. there now and uh, and so yeah he pulled out the the Riesling from Eden Valley um, you're looking at around a hundred year old vine so centenarian between survivor and centenarian mm -hmm. so which is really between 70 and 100 years old so vines of significant age and I love the back label, you know, it talks about, you know, the Gilbert family and the Evans family in Eden Valley that planted Riesling in the 19, sort of 50s, 1850s, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. 1840s. So Riesling has been a significant yeah. contributor and, you know, in the high country of Eden Valley, you know, it's just delicious. You know, the people out there don't know, we've already drank one bottle and I'm tonguing to open this other one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the soils in Eden Valley just lend themselves beautifully to Riesling, don't they? Just very skeletal, um, stony soils and very, you know, minimal sort of water. There's, you know, there, it's, they, they have this beautiful steeliness and, and, uh, and minerality. Yeah. Which is, uh, and that, that, that this wine just exemplifies that. It's yeah. a beautiful wine. Fantastic. We had an opportunity in a previous episode, I think our opening episode, to discuss um, the idea of this program being Barossa HQ and the, and the brand Barossa. The Barossa itself comprises two different propositions. There's the Barossa Valley and the Eden Valley. The Eden lies to the east and has um, the elevation. And we've already discovered and explored, actually, last week on the program um, that was dedicated to, to, to Shiraz, quite different tonality and expression with 
what happens in Eden as opposed to what happens on the on the valley floor. And it'd be fair to say that the story of reasoning is really that of the Eden Valley. It's not so much a valley floor thing. Yeah. It's not so much a Parossa Valley thing. It's very much um, from the Eden. I think what's fascinating about this. What what vintage is this? This is two thousand nine. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's still youthful, Absolutely. vibrant. It's um, you know, a lot of the Eden Valley Rieslings they tend to have that real sort of dry acidity in, the, in their youth, and some quite bone dry. And you know, with a couple of years of age on this, it's mm. those acidity it's just starting to fill off. up. And, yeah, it's yeah. it's really it's you know it's tidy. It's beautiful little yeah. little wine. And the crazy thing is, you know, this wine at their cellar door, I think you've got to you got to go and get it from there because they don't really sell it too sure. far. But this is like twenty bucks. This is like ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. a privilege for um, um, to drink something that's made from vines of that age. Just want to um, uh, not forget our audience here. It's very fascinating. But um, a couple of questions coming in. One of which was um, outside of the Brossa, whose job is it to protect the old wines that exist in in other regions? And I think it's fair to say that. The old vine charter, which started as a Yalumba initiative, has now been adopted by the Barossa. Is it effectively on offer to anyone that wants to, within the Australian community, anyone that wants to um, pick it up and adopt it? So from that point of view, it's a, it's a charter and it's a platform, but it's something that other regions can annex and, and, and adopt should they want to, which would then provide a degree of uniformity in terms of how a consumer understands what this nomenclature, what old vine from Australia means. So in a sense, we could see this old vine charter move throughout the other regions where that sort of resource is relevant. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, that, that's, a, that, that's exactly sure. probably what needs to happen, yeah. whether that does happen in the, yeah. in the diaspora of, uh, sure. of the Australian wine industry, well, I don't know. My point is the opportunity is there. It yeah. is so there. it's a democratic opportunity should yeah. we choose yeah. to... To, yeah. to, to influence. Now, just the other question that came through, and I think it's really pertinent to try and nail it, and, and maybe it'll take all of the wines before we determine that, is does the age of a vine or an old vine resource, such as that which is made this reason, does that have any impact or, or signature on how well that wine once made will actually age? So, in an essence, does an old vine wine have a greater propensity to age in bottle? I, I think um, I've, I think without a doubt that a, and, and it's, it, is, it is pertinent that, that um, you know the Barossa have chosen thirty five years in all my travels overseas. You know, talking to some of the great winemakers of the world, they've always told me in my, when I was a young kid starting out how important vine age is to mm -hmm. quality. And um, and uh, and the, the Brosser has has taken on that thirty five year thing. Sure. And that that you know all these old guys, these old times, these great winemakers, these great people from around the world, for, um, have have said you know a vine should be twenty plus to hit its straps. Yep. Um, you know a thirty five year old vineyard is well and truly entrenched. Its roots are deep, and it is going to make quality a s superior quality. To a wine that is, you know, under twenty years, mm -hmm. there is no question, and certainly a, a, a wine that's under ten years. Okay, so the, an the age only, is very the, important. The only thing that I would say, though, to that is, just because they are old, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great all the time. You know, age is, is it can be amazing, but there's also aspects of site specificness, yeah. where it is, what variety it is, in what area. So, you know, I always think that old vine, it's sort of like. Um, I think it was Matt Kramer, he said it was like the foundation ingredient, you know, it's like, it's amazing, but if you get the old vine on the right stuff, in the, yeah. it, you know, sure. it is just, it can be mind-blowing, um, but it, again, you know, you've got to like open it up to people and, and they can, you know, a lot of people are intelligent enough to taste and see what they think is, what they think is fair and of a quality thing, so. I think um, even, even though this is only episode three, I think we have already started to paint a picture that, um, great viticulture, great winemaking, is never about the singular pursuit of one particular property. It's all about a confluence of these things. So the assumption, well, we shouldn't make assumptions, but the, the composition that we're looking for is old vines on the right side, 
with the right soils, yeah. with with the right um, uh, cultivar, with the right varieties um, uh, planted yeah. that's appropriate, and then also with a sympathetic and empathetic hand of a winemaker. So it, it takes all of these things. So yeah. I don't think yeah. we're not trying to simplistically say that if it's old, it equals good. Yeah. What we're really trying to dig down to it. Or what are the things that a, a good old vine in the right place, in the right site, with the right handling, can bring yeah. that is simply not possible from something that's younger? And, yeah. and we'll discover that as we look through um, the rest of the wines. But I, I thought that was delicious, and I think for me what's fascinating is um, I never need much of an excuse to drink Riesling anyway, but the idea that an exchange of, of $20 can buy you something that's contemporary and current, 2009, yeah. And, and yet is the progeny of something that's over 100 years old. I think that's fascinating because we tend to think that as things age, they get they get fragile. And yet it seems to me that, that as things age, these vines become more cussed and more determined and more able to withstand the vicissitudes of seasons and, uh, and all yeah. that sort of thing. So for me, that's a, be a beautiful uh, snapshot of, um, you know, 100, 100 years in, 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 in your glass in a sense. Yeah. Um, what was that word again? The, Which one? The vi vicissitude. Vicissitude. Yeah, I like that. One C, so two S. So right. oh the the, the so ebb and flow, the nip and tuck. Yeah. yeah, whatever. That's now, um, Brett, Mr. Hewitt. <laughs> <laughs> On to the main course. Please. I enjoyed my uh, uh, glass of uh, rock and raisin. Was I did too. I, I did too. It was delicious. Got the dust off. Absolutely. Now we're into it. Um, <laughs> you bought two wines for us to see. Yes, I, I have. Um, first one's a Miss Harry. Yep. Uh, this is from predominantly, and um, and I must admit, as as we have uh, gone through making this over eleven vintages, we we exclusively used vines over eighty years old, and uh, now it's about probably eighty percent. But keeping in the spirit of the old vine chart of the Brosser Valley, we don't mention the, the old vine on the label anymore because okay. we do have about 20% of younger vineyards. But this is predominantly old, dry growing vineyards, and in fact, um, some of these vines go, are about 145 years old. Yeah. What so, are these vines? Uh, this is a Grenache, yep. Shiraz, Morved, Sinso, and Carignan. But You're having a cake and eating it there. We right? are, we are. Good. We, we, oh, we have it and eat it all the time. Um, the the Carignan and Sinso are just um, about, you know, 3 4% each. Yep. Make a significant difference. Later ripening, uh, lower sugar, lower alcohol, higher acidity. Important mm -hmm. part. Small, but, but we, we, we see that. <coughs> Grenache, it's about typically around... It varies from vintage to vintage. It has crop levels and season and, sure. and flavour, etc. Um, 60, 50 to 60 percent uh, predominant variety, uh, and that is Miss Harry, predominantly Grenache. Yeah. And Shiraz and Mourvedre. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, you know, from vines that the oldest, 145, 100 year old vineyard turning, you know, this year. Um, just beautiful, beautiful old Brossa Valley. Dry growing stuff. It's just magnificent. Now you talked about how the old vines, largely because their root systems are hardy, and and to a certain extent can withstand some of the the um, the bigger challenges of a warm year, the fiercer heats, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, what? I guess what 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 gives this wine its freshness? Because they're old vines, 145. But to me, it just seems so bright and vibrant. Yeah, yeah it's, it's delicious, isn't it? Um, I think it's. <laughs> I think we, we made a decision um, in, in our in our style ten years ago, a decade sure. ago, um, and that is the lovely thing about this wine. There, there's a there's a beautiful fragrance about it, a mm. beautiful um, fruit about it. There, there's there's all those things that. That when people talk about the beautiful wines out of the south of France, the Garig, the um, the dried Provencal herbs, the this, the that, the acidity, this wine's got it, mm. and, uh, and uh, you know it's it's a terrific wine. It's a, it's a beautiful Brosselli red wine. So you know, I love the fact that here you are, you you know you pulled in like five traditional regional varietals, all that have been in the area for a long time, 
and uh, you brought it all together. It's, you know, I think this is an amazing little wine. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing to me, it's um, it is fascinating, is that you know there is a lot of introduction of new varieties. You know, a lot of people getting on the buzz of oh, we should try this and try that and mm -hmm. try. And uh, some of it, like you know, Grenache and Shiraz and Mourvedre or Mataro, is some of the, the or you know the local growers and stuff will call it. They're only really starting, you know, some of them only took 50, 60 years to understand how to really bring the best out of the region in the variety, and then to have Cinso and Carignan and things like that, you know, the blend here, you know, it's just amazing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's gorgeous. Um, as far as fermentation and, and things like that with old old vineyards, um, at the end of the day, I think, I think we're allowed to, um, old vineyards will given that they're growing in the right spot and they're, you know, they're the yeah. right match as we've talked, we can extrapolate further. There's a richness mm -hmm. um, and a depth that will allow us to ferment longer and extract more, um, you know, and uh, maybe it's called soaking or, or extended maceration sure. or pre-maceration, whatever. So the, the um, amount of time the berries are actually in contact yeah. and sitting in the tank. Yeah, that's right. And, and, um, and that's, that's a lovely thing. But uh, younger vineyards will not allow some younger vineyards, or most younger vineyards, unless they're very good, won't allow you to do that because they'll be slightly out of balance. Talk to me very briefly because um, I've now got an increasingly clear picture emerging about the benefits of old vines and have an idea of what they actually look like. They get older and thicker and gnarled, and, and, and they're almost like um, little pieces of sculpture, almost. Um, how, as a vine ages, how does that impact what kind of crop level? But one of the things I'm thinking of, you're, you're talking to me about a, a wine that's so bright and vibrant and youthful. Um, it comes from vineyards that are up to 140 years old. At some point... 145. 145, excuse me. Not, <laughs> not to shortchange anybody, <laughs> my God. Um, the ability to produce volume, does that diminish as vines get older? or? Um, is that not an issue? I think I think dry grime diminishes it uh, because um, I think with irrigation you can pump volume. However, uh, these vineyards typically are extraordinarily healthy, mm -hmm. and uh, and with health is vigor and plentitude, and uh, and we find no difference between typically um, our old our oldest vineyard. And and um, you know a twenty thirty year old vineyard which we manage, we try we, we typically crop at the same level around sure. two and a half ton an acre. So uh, um, something going back to the idea of wine being really the art of composition in the way that music is and in the way that cooking is and in the way that art is. Um, putting all these ingredients together, would it be fair to say that that older vines in the right spot? have the ability almost to, to balance the vineyard themselves? Do you find that you have to step into the dance less from a winemaking sense? I, th I think that's, that's just absolutely critical to, to great right. wine is that it's just all in sync. Yeah. I know, I know some guys, they, they sometimes they get the fruit in from old vines and they go, should I acidify just a little bit just to say that I actually made it? You know, because <laughs> the actual, you know, in the right spot, the the fruit is so well balanced, you know, and and particularly when they're able to uptake their their um, the water that it needs, you know, um, it's interesting with some of the the depths of roots, you know, like you know, um, I saw a well, like for example, the other day, I know it was a 65 metre deep well, okay, it was massive, and uh, you say about 10 metre um, root zones, yeah. you know, if you get those vines in areas where there's a water table that's within 10 or even probably in some instances maybe deeper. You know, some of those old vines, they will keep pumping that tap root down until it sort of tries to hit some sort of water table sure. or some structure. And, and once they sort of do, I think they tend to just take what they need. You know, and yep. if you prune yeah. it right and manage it right, then all of a sudden the fruit that you're producing is balanced in the fruit itself. And, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's when, you know, old vines take on their own because in the end what you're trying to do is make the most and bring out the best of what that do, do you know what that, that's exactly right that old vines no, I've seen this with water, and you would have seen this with um, the freedom there's no question walking into the Brossa Valley an extraordinarily hot day in the middle of summer 42 43 degrees Celsius yep. and 
you look at the old garden vineyard plant at 1853, the Freedom's plant about 1846. 1843. 1843, yeah. so yeah. 10 years early. And and the leaves just 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 shining at the sun. Mm -hmm. Just pointing, tracking the sun. Where every other vineyard, including 110, 120 vineyards around it, yep. just drooping. Okay. An extraordinary inbuilt mechanism for these vineyards. These very these ancestral, even older than ancestral. Yeah. 150 years old versus 125, I can tell you there is a massive difference. And it is extraordinary to see it with your own eyes, and you have to be able to see it to believe it. Fantastic! That it just tracking, tracking the sun, like it's, it's its own being. Viticultural Darwinism at its greatest. You know, it's, I have it's to say, when it's forty bloody degrees and you're in your vineyard, mate, I'm at the pub. I'm not honestly air conditioning <laughs> or in the swimming pool. If you're out there, buddy, that's. Was You're a hard working, working man. I was barbecuing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dean, once we've been introduced to Miss Harry. We move on to where? Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the old garden. Beautiful. Um, which is uh, the 1853 uh, planting, and we'll there. Um, there you go, son. Yeah, I'd love some. Please, James. Oh, mate, I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, this this is just eight rows of... Um, can we get a shot on camera? Can you hold that one and, um, up to the no, camera I'm so we can... Eight rows kind of, of uh, extraordinary in. Mourvedre, which we believe is the oldest Mourvedre vineyard in the world, and we've been saying that for 13 years. And, uh, and no one's knocked you down yet? No one from Spain or France have knocked us down. In fact, we've had um, we've had mm -hmm. uh, Monsieur Charve from Jail Charve and also um, uh, Bo Castell uh, okay. visit the Brosse Valley with James Halliday requesting to see the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, it is an extraordinary vineyard. Um, and uh, completely dry grown. Every vine is that old. There's no replants. And that's the other thing that, that's great, is that when we talk about old vines in the Rosa Valley, we're talking about the existing original planting. Sure, sure. And, sure. and often I say I'm at a tasting somewhere in the world, and I say, bang, this is planted 1853. And then they say to me, but, well, how many are that old? But, so what are the, old, the age of the vines? And I say, well, well, it was 1853, 158 years old. Every single vine, where there's a gap, mm -hmm. uh, well, sorry, where a vine has died, there is a gap in the, in the vineyard. Oh, right, right, right. Which allows me to bring the barbecue in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, well. um, I have to ask, because that's a beautiful story. There are a couple of things that, one of which I think is just really charming, the idea of the old garden, because that's what the original settlers called their vineyards, isn't it? Yeah. They, they were referred to as, 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 as the garden. As, as garden. Yeah, um, which I think is rather nice. Have to ask, how did you come across that, and what's that sense of responsibility? Because you're now, God, more than a caretaker, you're almost a, a curator. It's a sort of you're, you're in charge of this. <laughs> you're kind of me so old. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not old. Like That's old. Yeah. My point is, what, what's the weight of responsibility looking um, after, that? and how did that come to be a resource that that that, that you could use? I knocked on doors, yeah. um, and I must admit, I think he's probably the fifth, he was the fourth generation, or fifth generation, yeah. um, old uh, Ross Cog, okay. who's, who's still, uh, you know, well he's not playing cricket or football, <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's uh, still kicking up, um, you know, still doing some stuff, and, um, and now I deal with his son Leon, yeah. and in fact I've also started to deal with, with Leon's daughter, so in the last 13 years, I've crossed over three generations. Fantastic. Which is quite an extraordinary yeah, process. Great. This, this is, the, that's what the process is about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, knocked on doors. He gave me a go. He didn't know who I was, but he, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a go. And um, and there, it, I, I, I can tell you, that making this wine is not a challenge. It's, it's, it's a humbling pleasure. Fantastic. It's an extraordinary experience to walk amongst these wines. How long have you been making this wine for, Dean? Um, Thirteen years. I think. Years. I think it was the first time um, that it had ever been made into a single vineyard uh, table wine. Yeah. In 19, the nineteen ninety eight vintage, which mm -hmm. was our first vintage, Good and year. Um, it was a terrific year. Yeah. I had no idea what I was doing, and, and in fact, Ross 
Because I uh, just suggested to me that, well, we always sort of picked a last, so maybe you should do that. And I remember, well, my wife remembers even more, Lou, Lou still remembers me lying awake at night worrying about this vineyard and telling me, well, just Ross said pick a last, so just pick a last. Um, and we did, and that was our first finish. It was extraordinary. Um, the the only other time I think it was made into a single vineyard was in the depths of the vine pool where he couldn't sell his grapes yeah. and couldn't bear to see it go to waste and uh, made it into a port. port. Um, and I think that might be still in his cellar. See, for me, actually, Dean, like, um, you know, it's only really been people like yourself that have actually looked at this variety seriously as a single varietal mm -hmm. wine. And, and I've been fortunate enough, you know, through the Kegel Club in the Barossa oh, to have, yeah. a, have a few, like, Mavedra or Mataros coming in, you know, through there. That's a good tasting panel yeah. on a Thursday night. And so to see people starting to look at that varietal and respect it individually... I think it's brilliant, you know. Again, I, I'm on the thing about all these people introducing all these varietals from all over the world, and this these were introduced from it's around the world years ago. It's been sitting there for over 50 years. Yeah. Um, with, yeah. That, with that in mind, and I don't normally do this, but I'm going to indulge you because I'm fascinated by this story, and I'm also absolutely delighted by the wine. Can you have a, a, a crack at describing that for um, those who may be listening and watching but maybe don't have a, um, a bottle of Old Garden in front of them? Um... The extraordinary thing about the old garden of Montverde is it, and and I really, you know, it, it has this depth and character that mm. younger vineyards and um, that, that don't have, and, and I can say that because I work with, uh, in fact, my company controls about 15% of the Montverde and the Brossa Valley. Right. And most of that are cuttings from the old garden. So we can see a, a direct extrapolation from zero years right through to 158 years old, yep. which is, which is a, a beautiful place to be. And I don't think there's too many wineries in the world that can actually see that. Um, and um, so, so the old garden, in, in, with this age and, and depth of vines and resistance to what's going on around it and just being its own self, yep. um, produces this, this um, as I mentioned before, this can, Consistency. We get chocolate, mocha, coffee. We get this this black cherry. Um, it's an extraordinary sure. uh, sort of flavour profile that, that manifests itself each year. Even even orange peel, which for yeah. a red wine yeah. is is it's, just like is extraordinary. Yeah, and yet that notwithstanding, I think all of those are, are wonderful descriptors and all relevant, and and you can kind of quite easily find them in the glass. There's also some notes here which I find more on the savoury spectrum, yep. and it's almost like that. Um, the lovely the French have a lovely term for it, gary, which is that sort yeah. of mix of wild dried herbs. Typically in the south of France, it would be rosemary and, and, and thyme, and those very heat resistant, um, yeah. incredibly aromatic, almost sort of oily kind of herbs. And I, th there are elements of that, mm. that sort of sage brush and rosemary mm. that I get yeah. out of that. But as well, that food. that really dark cherry stone yeah. flavour. It's it's absolutely delicious wine. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I think, probably the most important thing you can say about wine. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. The um that 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 whole sort of we we don't often see that in Australia that gurig yeah. that under yeah. undergrowth the um the the the, the, the dried Provencal herbs and uh, we get it in Miss Harry and again the Mulvert and Miss Harry are cuttings and bush vines generally, not not all of them, but some of them from the old garden. And I think we, we just see a, a consistency and lim uh, a linear yeah, um, a length to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. taste to the whole thing. So it, it's it's wonderful. All I can say it's wonderful to, to explore and so um, all I can do is endorse that opinion. That's a real um, privilege and a fantastic story. And great that uh, this is uh, 2009. Nine. That's yeah. Just going to ask you because lots of excited talk at the moment around the 2010 Reds that are coming out of the yeah. Barossa. Some released, some yet to be released, yeah. but we're on that sort of cusp. So quite a lot to look forward to. You made one in 2010. Yes, we did. Fantastic. Still in barrel. Still in barrel. Yeah. Going to go to bottle when? Uh, I haven't decided, but maybe. We'll pull out a barrel in 
February. Okay. But, you know, I'll wait until February to have a look at it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. No, um, well, hey, if, it, if it's taken 140 odd years, there's no point <laughs> in having it over, over a couple of months or weeks. Um, and 09, like 09 leading to 10, like those two vintages alone, you know, they're, they're pretty good. Oh, and I think with old vines, the, 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 you know, the winemaker's got to step in. We're not making commercial wines here. You know, yeah. that that six months, and each vintage is different. You know, sure. old, garden, sure. old garden's gone from um, 15 months. You know, I think the, the, the uh, seven, actually, with the drought year was, was only, you know, 13 months or 14 months. Yeah. You know, we, we've got to step in and, and, and make those decisions that are best for that vintage. Yeah. Um, the 10, yeah, can take a few more months. Fantastic. Thank yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Beautiful, um, Thank you, James. You're still on the couch, but we're going to hand over now to uh, James. You're going to tell us about a couple of wines that you brought along from uh, from your winery, from Langmar. Yep. And clearly, um, the clues in the title of the program. There's an old vine theme that's going to run through these two. So, um, we're in your hands. Do you want to? Do you want to lead us off into the tasting? Yeah, no worries. I don't really want to tip that out, Dean. Actually, to be honest. Well, you don't have to. We've got two glasses. We've got heaps of glasses. So, um, so I thought tonight, like you know, we're very fortunate. We have a few different varieties that we use mm -hmm. that we classify as part of our old vine wines. Um, you know, we do Grenache. We've actually uh, brought out a Mataro as well, like sort of um, inspired by those that have been working with it for a while. Um, and then we do Cabernet. Cabernet, amazingly for me, um, Cabernet is one of those varieties that you won't... You, there's only one vineyard, I believe, that will be over a centenarian or ancestral, and that's the um, Kalimna vineyard. Yep. And in fact, uh, it was Ray Beckworth who mentioned that the first ever vintage of Grange was made out of Cabernet in, the 19, in 1951, I think, and, uh, and that was made out of Cab, but the second year they made it out of Shiraz because there wasn't enough Cab in the Barossa. So a lot of the old vine Cabernet, was, you really find, is mainly from the 50s and 60s, and, um, but that was that transition from the Barossa going from that fortified wine-making drive to actual table, table wine, wines, yeah. you know. The Pimpolds have a, that access, the, the, don't they have that 120-year-old Cabernet Vineyard? Yeah, that's the, the one I too. Yeah, 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 I think that's Kalimna out that way. Right. But yeah, Cabernet was very scarce in those early years, so we try to have a, you know, anything that at Langmoll that's bottled in one of these bottles, which is a replica 1700s Bordeaux Claret bottle, mm -hmm. is dedicated to older vineyards from the Barossa. So, so, so what are we looking at? So tonight we've got the Orphan Bank, 2009. Give a little showy show to the camera. All right. Am I going close? Too close? That's all right. Cool. Um, Rightio. So, glass? Yeah, please. Thank you. So this is... Um, so this is actually a, bl <laughs> a blend of old vine um, Shiraz with our aim to get it around a um, that centenarian mark, around the 100 year old okay. mark. This is the Orphan Bank. This is the Orphan Bank. So this is, I brought it because, um, you know, for us, where we're situated, Langmile, was actually the second village of the Barossa, right? And it was established in 1842. And so anywhere along that road, um, you know, there was some of those ancestral plants. If you can imagine like, those early settling buildings and those long elongated, um, um, I suppose, uh, like um, Jeff Sharper would say in Bethany, like the Hoofendorfer system, you know, where one sort of uh, piece of land where one horse could work. So they're very thin and oh, narrow. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and in fact, on Langmile Road itself, there's a, an old ironstone building uh, which was called Arawira Wines. And Arawira Wines was established in 1847. And there's still that, right? yeah, there's still the old building that's still there. But someone's brought it, made it into a house. So, so when you consider like from very much the early days, and interestingly enough, when uh, George Five Angus had actually sent out um, his um, surveyors, I think it was Johann Mengi, he actually had written back to uh, George Five Angus before settlement and said that he proclaimed that the Barossa could be an incredibly amazing viticultural zone for the future. And, and it is. Yeah. In all honesty. <laughs> well, <laughs> but could you imagine is. some English guy coming over the hill and looking at this valley and going, wow, this could be great for viticulture, mm. you know? What, it's it, true. 
Yeah, it was quite a good <laughs> foresight, but he also thought that along the Parra River he envisaged large ships going from the Barossa Did to yeah, uh, well, Adelaide. We you know. Well, now that's a highway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Parra River's about two metres <laughs> wide and the torrents, we've got to fill it up ourselves. <laughs> so the Orphan Bank? So the Orphan Bank, um, thanks for getting me back on track. No, that's all right. That's my job. <laughs> so, um, so this is dedicated to Old Vineyard. Um, yeah. I think... Uh, basically what we had done is there was an old vineyard in the middle of Tanunda which we sourced fruit from for um, a, f a fair few years, um, around 145 year old, um, we believed was planted by the same gentleman that planted the Freedom Vineyard, Christian Oric. Right. Um, so what happened, uh, and I'll sort of talk through that buying pool thing, because in the 1980s when they went to rip out vineyard, um, the developers came into the Barossa and at one stage they wanted to actually subdivide really from Tanunda to Newry and make five acre farmlets through that whole area. Oh. So in the end it was the local residents association and, uh, and people that loved the Barossa. That's when the old vine started saying, hey look, you know, you just can't rip it out because of the cycle. And mm -hmm. So eventually um, the residents association that was formed, they, they fought and lobbied state government and local council and they ended up helping to sort of change the rules. and. And, uh, and guide the rules, so should I say. Where, what year was that? This is in the 80s, 86, wow. 87, 88. Extraordinary. Yeah, and they, they actually uh, convinced state government to uh, put town zones and say, right, you can't build outside the town zone. Which zones. is now a manifestation of what's just happened again. Sure, sure. It's a, a little bit, yeah, a little bit yeah. on a, 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 you know, it's sort of like been a stepping stone, I suppose. One of the great stories was um, what this company wanted to be a, uh, produce a big tank manufacturing plant in this beautiful viticultural area and the residents association had to take them to court because if it set a precedent it could open up a lot of doors and so they're in court and um, and the residents association has its local viticulturalist on the stand and, and the, the guy that's trying to fight for the tank farm says well you know why did why you know this land you know why is it premium for viticulture you know what do you know about vines in fact do you have an old do you have any vineyard of your own and I think that's when Prue said well I have two vineyards, I have Mount Edelston and, and Hill of Grace, and there was no further questions, and, <laughs> and the, the Resident Association won. But based on that, coming to the Orphan Bank, I am getting there, it's sort of a little bit like law and order. It's a trick, come on. So, but in the end, though, what happened is it puts pressure on the towns, because the town zone, you can only build inside the town zones. So if you imagine Langmile as the village, which was the original village um, before Tanunda, um, in fact, the name Langmile was changed during the First World War to Tanunda because um, of the association with Germany. So the, the village of Tanunda slowly grew around the village of the original village of Langmile, sure. and the last remaining aspects of uh, development w were, were sort of halted by vineyard. But as sort of the, the prices went up for the land, the vineyard became a little bit like, hey, I can get like $2 million for this land now, or I can sell fruit. And so in the end, uh, the grower that we're dealing with decided, well, I, I'm going to take the, the money. And, and, you know, you can't sort of hold that back. You know, that's part of the, the offset you get, like, when you do that. Is you Within still the rules of the council. Yeah, I, just, but, I have to say at this point, Jay, the only winemaker that I've ever met that won't take the invitation to talk about that wine. Oh, well, the <laughs> Orphan Bank. Yeah. Let's have it. 30 seconds. All right. Give me your elevator pitch. Well, the Orphan Bank. Well, I just... I'm no, 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 no. The Orphan Bank. Well, it's Shiraz and it's bloody delicious and it's from <laughs> old vineyards. But th this actual vineyard, this 145-year-old patch, it was destined to be ripped out by uh, ripped out for housing. <laughs> yeah, uh, ripped out. Thank you, whoever that was. So, oh, Steve, awesome. thanks, Cuz. And um, <laughs> so uh, with the um, with this though, it was going to be ripped out. So we decided that we weren't going to stand for that. So the grower and ourselves joined together and we actually relocated that vineyard. We went out. And and dug up each ah, vine this is, so I've seen one this on at a time. That's the story. I've seen this on YouTube. I was getting that's there. it. That's what we're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, the message that we were really trying to do with orphan so it's an orphan. To, yeah, but was to really show that hey, old vines are significant, and you know if you want to rip them out for houses, fine. But let's show let's show a sign, let's show a message that they are worth preserving. So yeah. for us, that little vineyard, three hundred and twenty vines. 750 kilometres, one vine at a time, still thrives on our winery now, on the banks. Now yeah, you, good on it. Yeah, you can't take 140 years of roots with you, and we know that the roots are quite a, a critical, important aspect to it, but it gives it a chance. You know, it's on our property. It will remain there for as long as we're alive and hopefully the next generation. There's, all, there's also a beautiful yeah. thing. Uh, the, the French have done a lot of study in, in the, the amount of wood that is on a vine. 
uh, and quality, and um, and obviously you know, 160 year old Shiraz, whether the roots are ripped up or not, you know what? It's got a, an enormous amount of water, mm. and um, and that's you know it's it's going to be quality. So what, cheese, by the way, yeah. So, so what we do though is that is what we call the the foundation the, ingredient. That's yeah. the heart and soul of this wine. But we do source hundred year old vines from Eden Valley. Shiraz yeah. um, to back into the, the Barossa Valley as well and it's really a tribute to it and uh, you know we hope that this is the sort of wine that people will turn around and go hey this is why old vines worth worth keeping yeah so yeah we'll go down. but this is all those traditional wine making so we're using the open fermentation the basket pressing no fining no filtration we're really trying to like sort of bring out what the vineyard has to offer yeah. um, some nice French oak uh, and that's really as a structural and support. You know how it is. If you get some really lovely fruit from that vintage here, you can support it a little bit more with oak. But it's really more there to support what the vineyard's offering, really, than become a dominant character. Just going to intercede here quickly, and that that's an absolutely beautiful wine. Thank you very much. Um, it, it would have been really good company last week when we were looking at Shiraz um, as 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 our hero was the title of last week's program. But that stands up. Um, Stands up and stands out. It's a, it's a, a beautiful bottle. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much indeed. A couple of questions coming through while we've been chatting away, and interestingly enough, someone's picked up on your thread of um, cabernet. And just the question: What's the oldest cabernet from the Barossa that either of you guys are either aware of or have drunk? I would have thought the Elderton guys would probably be Elderton, across. Yeah, Elderton had some old cabernet, but. My understanding is Pempolds have the oldest. It's eighteen eighty. Yeah, it's like a hundred and thirty-five. It's you know, it's an incredible block. Um, like I say, most cabernets were planted, and I'm not saying you know because the Barossa is quite diverse. Sure. Um, and if you've got cabernet in your backyard, you know that are hundred and thirty-five years old, it's not to say someone went and snipped some cuttings and planted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah which yeah, is sure. extraordinary yeah. though. That if if um, if Pempolds do have that, then. Um, if well, you know, I, I would like to see them, and they've just released a six twenty. Yep. That's. I would, I would like to see them actually produce a single vineyard from that well, one hundred and thirty five. Yeah, and they, ha they actually have great. been. Yeah, we we had a there was a, a Grenache, um, a Shiraz from ourselves, and and with Pempolds and all very old wines and the yep. Barossa wine auction last year. They okay. all sort of donated magnums and okay. so just from so that block. We'll just, um, the Cabernet's rather right. than cauterising the conversation, we'll make a note to um, Anne-Marie that well, I'll, I'll give um, Andrew Kyle a call. Andrew, who's making his own Mataro, as he likes yeah, to call he it now, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. in, in the Barossa. But Andrew's a wonderful... Uh, historian of the Barossa and particularly of, of what happens in Penfolds and I'm sure that if we ask him the Cabernet question he'll give us a uh, box and dice on that and we can make sure that that goes up on either Barossa HQ or, or, um, or Barossa Dirt. But I, I will say that Cabernet story with the Grange actually came from Ray Beckworth who yep. turns 100 next year and he's the guy that employed Max Schubert and I think Grange was discussed on a plane with a gin and tonic when they, before they made it, so he <laughs> told me. So. Is that right? Little bit of trivia. And Ray, who's famous, <laughs> um, without Ray Beckwith, no one would have a clue about pH stability. The mathematical. It's extraordinary um, uh, yeah. significance in terms of innovation and discovery. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we right. were lucky enough to have um, John in for lunch a few months ago. Yeah. Sharp as a tack, isn't he? Oh, Terrifying. Funny, funny. Yeah, yeah. It's bloody fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. Particularly excited. Well, I'm excited about all the wines, but um, this is is a, a little bit of a legend in its own lifetime. Can, can, can I just ask a quick yeah, question, yeah, James? Yeah. Did you use French oak or American oak with this? Uh, this is French. Yeah, it, it's uh, the evolution of, of where we came from. Was traditionally we used a little bit of American, but we found tighter grain mm. French. And uh, actually, my brother Paul, uh, who makes all yep. these wines, he's found he's got some really good relationships in the barrel making world and. Sure so, it does. Yeah. So no, definitely French. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, no, the French is a terrific, terrific match with um, Shiraz, and, oh. and, you know, sure. these, you know, Grenache. And seeing and um, people seem to be moving over to that more and more and making their own. Uh, own yeah, I think Am that. American oak. I mean, you know, it's it, it's sort of almost old fashioned, isn't it? Well, the interesting thing is to me is like, you know, obviously it's the tighter grain and, you know, there's a lot of places in Europe 
where oat grows very slowly and you know, I don't know if we've seen much of the Russian, the Hungarian and, and Bulgarian and all sorts, but in the end, you know, you, you literally do use the, the best advice that you've got at hand, and if you can't go to the villages or those areas yourself, you wait for people to knock on your door. So, I'm not yeah. here as an apologist for an American oak, because I, I always pick it as that slightly um, sarsaparilla, almost kind of root beer flavour type sweetness that it brings, but in a curious way, I think the generosity and fruit character of the Barossa can carry that off. And, oh, and the, the other week we were lucky enough to have a look at the um, the Elderton Command Shiraz and you know, it just works. Yeah. It is old school, but sometimes old school is kind of new school. So there are styles of wine which I still think can carry that. And just talking around a little bit um, about the improvements that have been made in American oak and particularly with the Missouri very fine tight grain. Yeah. I don't think that today's American oak is what it was ten yeah. years ago. Yeah. I don't well, know exactly it is, is, um, as coconutty and sarsaparilla like as it once and, was. And the great thing is that the whole diversity, you know, like we use American oak at Langmore, we use French oak. Yeah. You know, that diversity that's what enriches our lives. You know, it's those people that say, Hey, this is what I think Shiraz is and this is uh, you know the whole the whole gamut. And if we yeah. use American or French, that's that's great. Anyway, the wood in question this week I'm gonna, I'll is do the this. old vine. Yep, please do. Freedom for those that <laughs> haven't drank too much. Beautiful shop. Very good. Yeah. And the point that just came up, obviously, we've been talking about what really is not just a, an icon for the Barossa, not, not a word I like, but but a, a flagship for Australia in terms of Grange, of course, Grange has always been, and I would have thought in perpetuity it would always be in America. Yeah. Well, it's that it's it's that signature style, isn't it? That's it's almost more of a house style than anything else, isn't it? I, I love the fact that you know that you have that diversity, and you know that's the thing. You know, Dean has his he goes like, this is what I love, and this is what I'm going to make. And I think it was Andrew Kayard at one of the Barossa Generations lunch. He said something that really hit home to me. And that was make the wines that you believe in. Mm. And if that means you believe in making Shiraz with American oak or with French or, or be it whatever, whatever, whatever style you want, that's what brings the, that, you know, that's what brings it all together. Sure. I'd hate to drink the same stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, you're right. That, that's you know fundamentally what, what makes just trying to be things. diplomatic, yeah. <laughs> you don't have, but to, no, you you don't have to agree. To, you, you, we should be unreasonable. <laughs> I think we should be. Absolutely and uh, I listened to my son's, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, last, last, last little speech, say? Yeah. Unreasonable. Um, and uh, there was two other arms in there anyway. <laughs> but the point is, the point is that that it was it was about being what you you know just 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 go ahead and do it. Yeah. And what, what you believe in. And um, and so you know you're right. Yep. Grange, if that's American oak, well, and that's the style, and that sells for six hundred fifty bucks a bottle, well, and and it's going to go higher and higher and higher in the next few years. That's 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 it. It's a piece of art. Sure. And mm. uh, and and that's the way we're all. It's you know, a collectible piece of art. The and and you know, the freedom, old garden, orphan bank, you know, that all, in the end of the day, they're. Irreplaceable. No one else can do it because they're all single vineyard, and they're, they're all from they are, extraordinary they are, they are, which yeah. is um, which is the most important thing. It's, it's that whole to thine own self be true. You know, the, the, the best line out of Hamlet, spoken by the biggest fool, but it was probably the truest line. Tell us about this wine. Well, the freedom um, comes from one vineyard uh, in at Langmile, like in the original village. Yep. And, um, you know, from the research that we've done, you know, and, um, you know, when you're going right back to the really the beginning of the time of the, of the region, um, she can get a bit sketchy at some, some points. But one of the things we did learn is that there was almanacs that were produced for George Fife Angus by these first settlers. Um, and with that, um, they would report back and say, you know, Mr. Zagan had five goats, two ducks, and, you know, a garden and fruit orchard and, and so things like that. So it was like the... Um the, the, the English, the, the uh, what do you call it? 
William, the Conqueror took the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, like the yeah, ledger yeah. or something. Yeah. The Magna Carta. The, the Magna ledger. Carta, yeah. <laughs> so, so for us, sort of that's what we sort of reached back on and, and sort of try to determine the, the age of these vines. And So Christian Art, we have his family book, and his uh, family book is called Persecution to Freedom. And uh, and oh, and Dad sort of come up with the name about 3 o'clock in the morning, woke up in bed and said, Freedom! And I always thought Mum rolled over and said, well, "Do you want a divorce, Richard? What are you, what are you talking about?" <laughs> and uh, or he, says, he, he, he just says, watched uh, the. Um... <laughs> now he turned around and said, "Well, that's what we should call this wine because you know it really like the Christian Auric and the people that came sure. to Langmire, uh, they put their roots in the Barossa and the vines are very similar. Interesting with this Could vineyard, um, we do have because of the age of the vines, we do have some, and because the vineyard in fact had been derelict for about eight years and not pruned or managed. Uh, we did have some losses, like some deaths, in amongst it. So what we've been doing is doing layering or the Roman method where we actually hook a cane down underground yeah. and lift two buds up, so but keep it connected to the mother vine. And that's that's been really working well. And So you can keep that connected to the mother vine. You find that the trunk is thicker and it's narrower from the mother vine, but it's still connected. And, yeah. and, and you know, if it's sort of like... snip it off and fuse. Well, you don't even have to. Like, I've seen vineyards in Spain where... There's a whole row, they're yeah. all connected like that. Yeah. So the freedom to us, you know, it's an ancient old vineyard. Um, at 1843, it puts it around 168 years old. Um, we believe it's one of the oldest in the world, um, and pre are particularly. Um, you know, for us as a family, you know, my brother, you know, this is just an absolute treat. You know, to be able to work with vines of significant age, um, again, that open fermentation, basket pressing, uh, we've actually done since 1997, so we've had a few vineyards under our belt. Single vineyard, uh, interesting when you do verticals, you know, you really do see yeah. vintage variation, yeah. and Which to me that's thing. what's exciting, you know. Yeah. It's, we did a vertical recently in Vancouver for the Playhouse Festival, starting from 98 actually, and, um, you know, you get a show of hands, what vintage do you like, and you, there'd be, you know, four for this one, five for that one, and then there'd be 12 for that one, and and it really varied, but when you looked at it all, that they all held up really well. Mm -hmm. And again, that natural acidity, that balance in the fruit of these old vines from where they are located, yeah. you know, in the, around the para, um, it works really well. So you really don't have to muck around with it too much. But I will also have to say, you know, as far as old vines and representation of old vines, you know, here we are with 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 Dean and myself, two wineries. We've got one from Rockford, but. The Barossa, there's a lot, there's 180 wineries in the region and a lot of them do have their own little patch somewhere, sure. their old parcel, sure. and that's what makes it exciting so that you have such a, you know, this, this whole sort of template of different wines from different people and so that shares through the, and yeah, you know, so it's, it's a diverse offering that most wineries will only have small productions of. But if you get an ability or an opportunity to taste some of them, they can be incredible. What, uh, what do you think of the wine, actually? Oh, I, I think they've all been um, they've all been extraordinary, and I particularly enjoyed the last two um, in the context of last week, looking at Shiraz, and for me, it was just dis discovering that um, once again, you think you're talking about a very singular proposition, or also Shiraz, and yet there's a multiplicity of styles and expressions and I guess this has just added another layer of detail on it for me in terms of not only just moving around the parishes as, as we discussed yeah, yeah, um, yeah. the other week. I love that word. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? But but also the age of the vine, I didn't realise that that could be yet another layer of detail. And I, I guess, you know, I said earlier on that I thought that the, the greatest responsibility a glass of wine had was to be delicious and I think everything this evening has had that. And I think we need to be very careful as a community in terms of how we engage people and how we use language. And sometimes I think there's too much information. It's too much about how something's been made as opposed to what it can actually do for you once it's in the glass. But what I'm finding fascinating is just understanding the different layers of detail that don't compel you to go down there. But if you're interested, you can always learn a little bit more. Where is it from? What's the vineyard about? What's How's the grapes been grown? How's the wine been made? Has it been French? Oak? Has it been American? Oak? Ultimately, these things aren't there to get in the way. They're there to help you better understand your preferences, yeah. I think. So yeah. why do I like that? We'll find out a little bit more about what went into the wine, and then you can start determining what your preferences are. But I thought they were all great. I thought the reasoning was 
just fascinating. As I said, when we came out at the top of the program, I had no real expectation that that there would even there would even be a white one on the table that, that related to yeah. um, to old vines. I think Miss Harry is just a seriously dangerous date, far too <laughs> just fantastic. I find that that's um, um, once again, I think, <laughs> as well as being delicious, the ability to you know, want another glass is a, is a really wonderful thing for a bottle of wine um, to offer you. The old garden, I just, uh, I love the story, I love the idea that when everyone else is feeling the heat, literally a hundred and however many years it, it is, it's perky as hell and it's just following the it's sun um, around the vineyard. And I love that, that generational sense of how you came across the vine in the vineyard your commitment to making this, and and now you're dealing with the third generation of the family. No, um, no, no probably sixth. Sixth, I beg your pardon, yeah. that's come into it. When we finally got to the story the of the Harnell, sorry, but I waffle. <laughs> you so undersold that. <laughs> Suddenly, you kind of uproot the vineyard. You're into town planning mode. Yeah, I know. And, and then the idea is you've actually moved this bloody thing and put it somewhere else. I thought that's fantastic. And then, genuinely, I think you can have huge interest in wine or a passing interest in wine but when you start talking about history and something as significant as generations passing yeah. and literally centuries moving you know you've yeah, got yeah. to go back four or five generations within a family line yeah. to determine that I think that whether you're into wine or whether you're into whiskey or whatever your preferred thing I think the opportunity to sit down and taste something that was planted and is still producing when this country was being discovered and founded. I think that's kind of profoundly moving and fascinating. And I, as I said, you know, I, I mentioned this idea, not that you gentlemen need to be feel old and venerable, but the responsibility of not caretaking these vines, I think it's more like curation. It's more like how you look after a body of work and, and, and preserve that and seek to share that. I think that's a hell of a responsibility for a start. I think it's an enormous privilege, but what I'm delighted about is um, it seems like a lot of fun too. Yeah. And um, what goes into the glass at the end of the day, I think all of those are, are, are in their own and unique and different ways um, great things. What I think I'd like to try and do, which we sort of started the top of the show with, um, you know, old vines in a nutshell, what do they bring? And we discussed how. Um, actually unusually for a new world country, for a southern hemisphere country. Mm. We're blessed with this treasure trove, I, I, I guess, this resource to it draw is, from. Um, we're particularly lucky in South Australia, in, in, in the Barossa, where you guys make wine, that there seems to be such a, a concentration of own vine, uh, old vine material. Mm. There is a communi community based drive around creating this old vine charter which is a movable feast. Yeah. So for those regions that are that are asking themselves or like pursuing their it. own line of inquiry and, yeah. and, and um, you know, one can think of the hunter, one can think of uh, a number of other regions yeah. where there is significant age and history behind. Yeah. Maybe that's an opportunity to look at. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea that something gets sort of sturdier and more robust and able to express itself as it gets older when again in, in, in you know the age that we live in we tend to think that if it's the newer it is the better it is and I think it's lovely to think that something that's that old and mature still has something to offer that youth cannot overcome I think that's a fascinating idea but I really would like the last words of um, this episode to come from you guys so why should a wine drinker make one opportunity to seek out an old vine wine. What are they going to find? Is, it, is this a 30 second thing? I no, think it's... I'll tell you it's a 10 Ch second James, thing. James, come in 30 you'll, minutes. You'll, 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 you'll name it in half an hour. Yeah, you've got 10 well, seconds, mate. Well, I, I personally think just from, um, with, from not notwithstanding a wine quality aspect yep. of it, I, I think that the, the bottom line is, is that it's something that we can offer the, the world of wine that is quite significant. And when I look at the world of wine, I look at some of the great vineyards on earth, right? Like I look at the wine industry as a global industry mm -hmm. that sure we might be a short term player being what 25, 30 years 
in this current era, not talking about the four to fives and the thirties. But we do have vineyards that have got the significance that, you know, like a, a Clodagh Mill from Krug or, mm. or wherever. And, and to me, that's where the old vines and some of these significant old vineyards in the right places will have their mark. Mark my word, one day people will understand that we have some incredibly fascinating and brilliant old vines that aren't just fruit, it's complexity, it offers a lot. So to me, old vines are a significant part of our story. I think that's terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Dean? To taste a wine that's made from a vineyard that's over 100 years old, 150 years old, that has the history and the, 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 the depth and the richness and the inheritance that we talk about yeah. is an extraordinary thing that you have an opportunity to do as a wine lover and you really should embrace. Fantastic. I would like to ask you, just in signing off, to um, if we're lucky enough, and I don't think the time probably, or the time frame probably accommodates it very well, but I just thought it's um, Thanksgiving. So to our friends, oh. maybe tuning in from the US um, or North America, I hope you're sitting down with your turkey and your cranberry, and I hope there's an old vine bottle of Barossa something. Miss Harry does particularly yeah. well with cranberry. There we go. <laughs> anyway, happy <laughs> Thanksgiving. Chuck, <laughs> Chuck Haywood's watching. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>